What if you like, but I like using those things. All right, well, the trick there is to set up a convenient system that allows you to send the gray water where you want, when you want. So the city of Tucson has re recently passed an ordinance that by 2010, all new homes just that little section of pipe put in at the time of construction. What you typically have is just the vent stack and the pipe to the sewer. This is the extra. So if you want to hook up to it, you can just put in a three-way valve and connect the pipe to the landscape without having to jackhammer through your floor or drill through your walls. The pipe's already there, ready for you to access. It makes it real convenient. And by putting the valve right here in the room where you're using it, it's really easy to decide what happens. You're washing your hands with good soap for the landscape, like Dr. Bonner's. You send the valve to the landscape. Everything's good. Then you feel some pimples coming on, and you want to you know, take chlorinated bleach and carefully scald your face, okay? Before you do that, you direct this, and you send those toxins not to the landscape, but to the sewer, okay? And then you scald your face, get that treated at the hospital, come back, and when you put that away, you send the Dr. Bonners back to the landscape. Okay, so this works as you start shifting, perhaps, what products you use. And let's say you've had biblical rains, you can send the gray water to the sewer if your soil is saturated. And if you're in a cold climate and your soil is frozen, you can send it to the sewer, and then when it warms up, the landscape. All right, this is a landscape in Tucson, irrigated with rainwater and gray water, no drinking water. There's a property line, rainwater off the roof, into these basins, from the washing machine into these basins. Super simple system, all gravity fed. Now to layer in another piece, let's create those water harvesting earthworks, those rain gardens, those gray water harvesting gardens, within a 30 foot radius of our buildings. That is the oasis zone. That's where the bulk of the resources are. That's where the water is, rain falling from the sky, runoff off the roof, and household gray water coming out the pipes. It's also where you are to care for the plants and enjoy the produce. So once mature, the trees on the east, north, and west look great, and they become a living air conditioner and heater. How is this possible? It's because if you pay attention to how the sun rises and sets throughout the year, it rises and sets to the south and due east and west in the winter, and rises and sets to the north and due east and west in the summer. So here's how sun and shadow play in the summer months and the winter months. Morning, noon, afternoon, morning, noon, afternoon. So we're shading and cooling the house all morning and afternoon long in summer, but all winter long we're letting in the free heat and light, okay? This way, we can, um, this can result in up to a 20 degree Fahrenheit reduction in ambient temperatures around buildings compared to buildings without such shade trees. And this can greatly reduce your heating needs by up to 50 to 80 percent. Okay? Again, not buying anything, just orienting to the sun and the landscape. Okay? And you might be wondering, why is he talking about heating and cooling when he's supposed to be talking about water? Well, you are using rainwater and gray water to grow your living air conditioner and heater. And for every kilowatt hour of power you consume, you're consuming from a half gallon to 20 gallons of water at the power generation plant. So anything you can do to reduce your power consumption reduces the community's water consumption. Jump to the street. Uh, we want to move away from these excessively wide streets with no street trees, creating the heat island effect because they absorb the heat the sun's heat during the day and radiated out at night. This has contributed to a six degree Fahrenheit rise in summer temperatures in Tucson since the 1940s. Um, whereas here, a different scenario in Davis, California, the streets are no wider than 20 feet, whereas this is 40. That allow, and then they plant trees right off the street, irrigated with the runoff from the street. The street's raised or crowned and it drains it to basins on either side. So this has resulted in a 10 degree Fahrenheit drop in summer temperatures, creating the cool island effect instead of the heat island effect. It's not so hot, it's a lot cooler, people don't run their air conditioners so much, so then this leads to a reduction in our contribution to global warming, okay? Because if you're powering your air conditioner with coal or whatnot, you're contributing to a bigger problem. But if you're instead cooling things with a tree, you're creating solutions. All right, and here's how we can do it in Tucson. Um, if you notice the curbs flow like an ephemeral creek when it rains, let's recognize it for what it is, let's call it what it is. It is an ephemeral creek, so let's plant the native vegetation you would find growing along an ephemeral creek, and then let's cut the curb to allow the water in. This is now legal in Tucson, you can get this permitted. 
Um, so the water comes in, fills up, backs up on itself, and the surplus goes down the street to the next one, fills up, backs up on itself, goes on down. So it's a self-maintaining system. These act like backwaters or eddies in the flow. And you do the calculations, you find the average residential street in Tucson drains over a million gallons of runoff per mile. It's just the rain falling on the street. A million gallons per mile per year. Okay? That's enough water to sustain 400 low water use native shade trees per mile, or one tree every 25 feet on both sides of the street. So every street in Tucson could be a greenway, you know, force a canopy, making it shady, cool, inviting in the wildlife, even growing food, and irrigated it only with rainfall and runoff from the street. So thereby doubling is our community's flood control. So we did this at my brother and I's house, in front of our house, in the public right of way. This is what it looked like in 1994. 10 years, or I guess 12 years after planting, this is what it looked like. So that landscape irrigated entirely with rainwater and street runoff. No drinking water. And uh, just to wrap it up, so my time's out here, um, to go for the bigger sustainability picture, um, we need to live within our water budgets as individuals and as a community. Okay, we lost the Santa Cruz River. Our water table has dropped over 300 feet since the 1940s and continu continues to drop. The only way to sustainably get back in balance and have more regenerative natural resource base is if we live within our budget. What's your budget? Well, I'm advocating looking at your length and width of your site to get your total area catchment area, multiply that by rainfall in feet, multiply that by 7.48 to convert to gallons. That's how much rain falls on your site in a typical year. Strive not to use more water than falls on your site in a typical year. And you just heard that that is very possible to provide your domestic water and swimming pool water. Um, and, uh, but you got to look at reality. Don't just look at your calculation. Go out and see, are you losing rainwater to runoff? you got to subtract that from your budget. Are you gaining water from run on from your neighbor's site on yours and it's sticking around? Okay, then you can add that to your budget. You can keep, change things so this doesn't run off. Get away from this scenario, tweak things, so you keep the water on the site. And if you can set the example as an individual, and you can help influence the community, and if Tucson can shift from a community that is currently extracting fossil water and importing Colorado River water from 300 miles away and an elevation rise of 1,000 feet and shift more to living within the balance of our own local water resources. Well, maybe someday in the distant future, the Santa Cruz River could flow again. Or at the very least, you can go to bed and have a very sound sleep knowing that you're not contributing to the killing of your local community. You're instead contributing to the enhancement of your local community. And you can get more information on that website and books and thanks for your time. All right, I'm not going to talk about killing the city uh, like Brad was. Well, it's, I'm going to show some ideas of maybe what you could do to actually improve on your own home. Um, it's going to be kind of a, a brief overview because there's so many scenarios. Each house is very individual. Brad has great illustrations of, of which way your house points and your trees and stuff like that, but inevitably the builders don't usually see it that way when they build your house. And so our goal is to come in and try to figure out how we can make Brad's theory actually work on your house after we store it in the system. So the basins and stuff like that are actually a great concept. You know, for example, if your tree only requires 50 gallons of water, and you're getting 300 gallons of water coming off your house, why not store that first and be able to disperse it at 50 gallons every time you want to water that tree instead of overwhelming it? So, um, these pictures, I'm not sure if they'll be in order. Um, I had somebody else throw them together, so we'll narrow it. This is basically if you're looking to start and build your own cistern, just a generic version of one, a culvert style that I'm sure all of you see around town. You're getting the concrete, and then, 